it's you and me again, buddy. Um, the rotator cuff. We've talked about the rotator cuff before. I'm going to talk about supraspinatus because it's, it's, it's a little bit special. It does get injured quite a bit and I'm going to use this guy's bony anatomy to help me describe some of the problems that supraspinatus muscle and his tendon encounter. Oh, I can feel it anyway. Um, Shoulders are kind of something I'm quite interested in as well because I'm a rock climber. We're going to talk about the anatomy of the supraspinatus muscle, its functions, its actions, where it attaches to, where it runs, the bony things around here, its innovation, its blood supply, and um, how to strengthen it, I guess. How to strengthen a healthy one anyway. We're running exams this week and I'm already feeling a little bit drained. Right, should have had another cup of coffee. Rotator cuff muscles, we're talking about the shoulder region here, the shoulder joint. There are lots of joints in the shoulder. I like to call it the glenohumeral joint. So we have the scapula and the scapula has a glenoid fossa, like the socket of the joint. We have the humerus and the humerus has its head which is the ball of the ball and socket joint and that is the glenohumeral joint. It's a wonderful joint because it allows us to move our upper limbs in all sorts of configurations which is very handy but the trade-off for being able to widely move this joint is that it's weaker than other joints in the body and there are various methods and mechanisms for keeping this joint together and keeping it safe and the rotator cuff muscles are part of that. They are four muscles running from the scapula to the humerus. They're called the rotator cuff because they form a cuff holding the humerus into the joint and also many of them are involved in rotating the humerus. We're particularly interested in supraspinatus though. This is the scapula, this is the spine of the scapula. You can palpate the spine of your scapula. The most interesting thing about this is that if you move your upper limb you can feel your scapula actually moves around. It's not fixed to the thoracic cage, it kind of floats around, is held in place by muscles and this bony joint here. So the scapula moves part of what gives us that high mobility of the upper limb. This here is the acromion of the scapula, the highest point. This is the clavicle, the strut that kind of pushes this away from the body. Um, and this is the coracoid process here. Okay. The supraspinatus muscle is superior to the spine of the scapula. So it lies here and it runs through this bony tunnel. So it runs inferior to the acromion. Um, there are various connective tissues and ligaments holding all this together. But this idea of this tunnel inferior to the acromion of the scapula is important. So if one of supraspinatus's roles is to stabilize the humerus in the glenohumeral joint, another role is to pull the humerus like this. So it, if the arm is hanging by the side of the body, it pulls the arm away from the body. This is abduction. There's another big muscle here. This nice rounding of the shoulder here is the deltoid muscle. It's much bigger than supraspinatus. The deltoid muscle is running from the clavicle and the scapula to the humerus. When the humerus is beside the body, it's really good at holding the humerus into the shoulder girdle so that when you're carrying, say, a heavy load like a bag of bricks, because we're all carrying bag of bricks, right? Um, the humerus isn't pulled out of the joint. If you look at the bony parts of the joint here, if this joint is gonna dislocate, it's gonna dislocate inferiorly, not superiorly because of these bony bits up here. So the deltoid is very good at holding the humerus into the shoulder girdle, into the glenohumeral joint. And then we have trapezius up here, holding the shoulder girdle into the axial skeleton. So then this is really good at bearing loads, but if you want to abduct your upper limb, yeah, deltoid, if it contracts, it's pulling the humerus this way. It's not very good at abducting the upper limb, but supraspinatus, because of the way it runs tightly over the top of the humerus, and we'll look at the details in a moment, don't worry. This can pull 
the humerus and essentially rotate, spin the head of the humerus in the glenoid fossa and cause it to begin abduction. Now that abduction has begun, once we've got to say 15 degrees of abduction, deltoid now, if it contracts, it can, it can take over and do a good job of abducting the upper limb the rest of the way. To raise our arm any higher, we need to rotate the scapula, but that's a story for another day. So, supraspinatus is important in beginning abduction. Two more ideas for you. The first one's kind of the same as the first idea though, is that um, stabilizing the head of the humerus in the joint means that not only does it begin abduction of the upper limb, but when the limb as is abducted, the, the supraspinatus muscle is continuing to stabilize the head of the humerus in that joint when we put our arm into different positions. So supraspinatus isn't just about abduction, it's also about stability after abduction. Second additional idea is that, I can't actually do this with this model because it's the way it's nailed together, but the supraspinatus muscle runs over the top of the humerus, so superiorly over the head of the humerus, um, which means that as, as the humerus abducts away, the supraspinatus muscle actually keeps it down, right? It's running over the top, so it keeps it pressed down. So it keeps the head of the humerus into the glenoid fossa so that it spins as it should, right? Keeps it in place. This is another, another thing we mean by stability of the joint. If supraspinatus is weak then and doesn't do that, it means that as you abduct, the, the, uh, the head of the humerus could actually rise superiorly up the glenoid fossa and there is not a lot of space here and there are some soft tissues that would get squashed. Actually, sorry, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I've got another skeleton. Another, ske another skeleton, sounds terrible, doesn't it? But. Uh, that's actually strung together with elastics that lets me show this a little bit better. It's just a bit hard for me to get my fingers in here to be supraspinatus, but I showed you on the other one, right? So supraspinatus is here. It will keep the head of the humerus in place as it rotates, right? Because it's applying this downward pressure. If it's weak, then the humerus can rise up. So instead of spinning, instead of spinning like this, it could spin up like that. Does that make sense? I think that's quite a nice demonstration. Yeah, so the idea is that the, the supraspinatus muscle is actually applying a compressive force. It's keeping the head of the humerus down. So then as you abduct, it keeps the humerus in place as it should be. And all the soft tissues up here have got plenty of space to live in. Uh, if the supraspinatus is weak and doesn't do that, and as you abduct, the head of the humerus rotates up, then it starts squashing supraspinatus and all the other things that might be up here. Okay, that's the function now, nitty gritty anatomy. I said this was the spine of the scapula and there is a, a fossa here, this beautiful depression. So that is the supraspinous fossa. So much of the muscle of supraspinatus is in there. So a fossa, fossa being a bit of a depression. So in there, that's where the supraspinatus muscle arises. And then it passes through this bony canal inferior to the acromion of the scapula and out to the humerus. Now the, the humerus, we see two tubercles here, a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle. And the supraspinatus muscle, I cannot get my fingers in the right place for this one because there's a lot of bits and bobs. But the uh, supraspinatus muscle, its tendon will run over the head of the humerus and insert into the greater tubercle. You might even say it inserts into the superior facet of the greater tubercle. And then it can pull on the humerus like that. So it inserts into the superior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. Ow. So, don't forget the joint as a whole. 
The uh, glenohumeral joint is a synovial joint, which means there is articular cartilage and a synovial capsule and ligaments and what have you stabilizing all this together. So the supraspinatus muscle is running over that synovial joint as a whole. Oh yeah, I've got a model. Here is the scapula covered in muscle. There's the spine of the scapula there. There's the clavicle. So this is supraspinatus. So that is the tendon of supraspinatus appearing from deep to the acromion and passing into the greater tubercle of the humerus. Speaking of synovial joints, um, there is a subacromial bursa, a bursa running between the tendon of supraspinatus and the acromion and the deltoid muscle that is running over here. Now a bursa is um, like a synovial joint, it is a synovial capsule with synovial fluid inside it. So it's beautifully slippery, very, very low friction uh, uh, surfaces. So that subacromial bursa means that everything can move around nicely in the shoulder joint and it all feels ever so good. But that subacromial bursa then is another structure that we need to think about up here. And it's a structure that needs some space. So we wouldn't want the humerus compressing it as it moves around, subacromial bursa. What's the innovation to supraspinatus? Well, just around here, coming out of the neck and running through here, we have the brachial plexus and the sensibly named Suprascapular nerve comes from the superior trunk of the brachial plexus. It has origins in spinal nerve C5 and C6. Um, the suprascapular nerve innervates supraspinatus. Blood supply, um, through here we have the um, subclavian artery and the thyrocervical trunk is a branch from the subclavian artery and the suprascapular artery supplies blood from that to the supraspinatus muscle. Okay, seems like a pretty sensible muscle. Uh, what's the problem then? Well, it's a pretty small muscle. And if you're, say, doing a sport where you have a lot of repetitions where you're raising your arm above your head, say swimming, uh, that sort of thing, then overuse of that muscle, just like the overuse of other muscles, could lead to inflammation and swelling. It could lead to degenerative changes. And there's not a lot of space in this canal inferior to the acromion. So any sort of swelling is going to cause pain as it rubs against these other structures. Also with age, we may see degenerative changes and, of, and weakness of supraspinatus as we see weakness in other muscles around the body. And as I said, weakness of su supraspinatus allows the humerus to roll around the joint instead of roll within the joint. And look, look at this here. So there's the greater tubercle. And look how the greater tubercle moves up into the acromion, giving less space for everything, causing impingement, causing compression. And that might cause more problems to the tendon. We see tendinopathies, we see, uh, we see pain, we see more degenerative changes, uh, and it causes pain in the shoulder. So this might be pain that occurs on abduction. And don't forget the other structures here. Um, so if the bones change, if we get bony spurs or calcification of soft tissues around here, then suddenly there is less space for supraspinatus and all the other bits and bobs around here, causing further pain. So that's the anatomy relevant to supraspinatus and supraspinatus impingement. How can we prevent this occurring? Well, if you've got healthy shoulders, you can strengthen your supraspinatus muscle just like you can strengthen other muscles. Well, we've said that supraspinatus does abduction. So abduction 
will help strengthen supraspinatus. There have been an awful lot of studies and research and electromyographical studies done to work out how best to strengthen supraspinatus, you know, how to recruit that while not recruiting other things. And um, I think the, the current consensus is, is abduction to 90 degrees with your thumb pointing upwards and not out to the side, but a little bit anteriorly. So what you're doing here is the scapula is not flat to the back. So the, glen the glenoid fossa isn't pointing out laterally. The, the scapula is curved around the thoracic cage, right? Which means that the glenoid fossa is pointing a little bit anteriorly, maybe about 30 degrees anteriorly. So you want to put your humerus in line with your scapula, which is about there, because then the supraspinatus muscle is in a nice tidy line. Um, if you have your thumb up, it seems that you're less likely to cause impingement problems. So you, if you want to strengthen supraspinatus, you abduct your arm with your thumb pointing to the sky a little bit anteriorly, not straight ahead, not to the side, but a little bit anteriorly. And then you, do -do 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 -do. and you could use gravity, you could use elastic bands, and you could use weights and the usual principles of uh, strengthening muscles applies in terms of numbers of reps and the amount of weight and what have you. This is for a healthy shoulder. If you haven't got a healthy shoulder, what I'm talking about might not be what your problem is. So you should go and see a doctor or a physiotherapist and work out what the problem is and see if this, this is the way to, the way to strengthen it and help it. You might need a period of rest before you do any exercises. Now, if you've got healthy shoulders like me, if you're doing exercises in the gym to strengthen your shoulders, like the military press, like military press, military dumbbell press, those are really good exercises for strengthening supraspinatus and looking after the rotator cuff muscles and the other muscles of the shoulder that are stabilizing that joint. There are lots of ways of strengthening supraspinatus. Uh, from the clinical side, people are most concerned with how can you strengthen or rehabilitate supraspinatus and be less likely to damage it. This gets called the, the full can method. The, the empty can method is the older method, which also works well. There's just a slightly greater risk of causing further damage through impingement at this joint, right? And remember, this is not medical advice. I'm telling you the normal anatomy. It's an interesting muscle because of its role in stabilizing the shoulder and how it does that. And also that bony route that it takes, isn't it? Isn't it fascinating that it takes that bony space through there and that causes problems and it keeps that... Anyway, um, so we've looked at the anatomy of supraspinatus, um, how it fits into the scapula, how it attaches to the humerus, its nervous innervation and its blood supply and how you might strengthen it. All right, see you next week. I'm sure I can feel my, I'm sure I can feel my supraspinatus.